Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this press conference from the second day of the 48th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum here in Davos. Um, yesterday was a little bit the Indian-Canadian day, and I'm not uh, telling you a secret if I say today was uh, quite a European day uh, at the annual meeting uh, here in Davos. Of course, uh, not exclusively, but with a heavy European uh, footprint, I think that is fair to say. And therefore, we're very happy and delighted to have a wonderful panel um, to talk about Europe and talk about the future of Europe here today. And without further ado, uh, let me uh, introduce that wonderful panel to you. My name is Georg Schmidt. I'm the Head of Corporate Affairs at the World Economic Forum. And welcome to everyone here in the room, those of you watching the live stream, whether on Periscope, Facebook, or on websites. And of course, welcome to the fantastic panel. Um, to my immediate left, we're joined by Martina Larkin. She's the head of regional strategies, Europe and Eurasia. She's also a member of the executive committee of the World Economic Forum. To her left, we're joined by Pierre Carlo Paduan, the minister of economy and finance of Italy. Right at the heart and center of our panel, uh, we are joined by Ursula von der Leyen, the Federal Minister of Defense of Germany, and uh, if I might add, also a member of the Board of Trustees of the World Economic Forum. Uh, welcome. To her left, uh, we're joined by Emma Marcegaglia, the Chairman of ENI uh, in Italy. And last, but definitely not least, completing this evening's panel is Jörn Wieck Knutstorp, the Executive Chairman of LEGO Group, of course, from Denmark. Thank you very much for being here. Um, Martina, um, let me hand over to you first and uh, ask you for a brief introduction, um, especially also for our live stream audience. Um, what is the forum doing uh, in the field of Europe? The title we gave this press conference, humbly as usual as the forum, a fresh start for Europe. Please share with us some thoughts on the forum's work. Thank you, Gary. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, certainly after today's uh, programming, Europe programming, we can say Europe is back. It was very... Uh, strong messaging from a number of, of European political leaders and, and business leaders in the programming today. So uh, it seems very timely that we launched this report on Renew Europe. Um, this was an effort that we've launched uh, last year. It, it was an effort over several months where we worked with a policy group on five different themes, on security, uh, immigration, economy, democracy, but also energy and sustainability, and most importantly, also a group of youth from across the continent that are attached to, to our Shapers community. And we developed new ideas, but also very concrete uh, action points and aspirations for the future of Europe, what, fu what, what Europe could look like in the future from a, a perspective of the next generation. And perhaps there's three key conclusions. There was a number of ideas coming out of this on, on sort of universal learning rights and digital IDs and, and, and ways to, to you know, make uh, Europe much more sustainable, but also take global leadership in the space of security. Um, but perhaps there was three cross-cutting themes uh, from our perspective. One, certainly, which came through very strongly also from the youth communities was that Europe needs to stand up for its values and that youth feels there needs to be much more commitment to European values of, of openness, diversity, but also collaboration and cooperation solidarity. Um, secondly, the, the, the fourth and last revolution and, and Europe's leadership in really embracing this and taking a leadership role in shaping the digital economy, shaping the way we're dealing with artificial intelligence, robotics, and all these new technologies that are shaping the economy, society at large. And then perhaps thirdly was a sense of urgency that 2018 will be an extremely important year for Europe. We still have the Italian elections coming up and of course the German government is not entirely formed yet. So there's a couple of still, I would say challenges ahead, but in general, we can certainly say that there's much more positive momentum on the economic front, on the political front, um, than we had last year at the same time. And we think we want to you know, really take on this momentum, take on some of these reform efforts that have been proposed by the French president and German chancellors and others, and really show also that there can be results as we go into 2018 for the citizens who really demand also a different approach to the future of Europe. Thank you, Martina. Uh, Minister Paduan, uh, my colleague mentioned challenges. Um, maybe I might invite you to share some ideas on what's being done to address these challenges from an Italian perspective. Yes, and thank you very much for this opportunity. 
Well, first of all, let me start exactly from where Martina ended, uh, maybe rephrase the point. Uh, Europe is facing a very large, larger than expected window of opportunity because of stronger growth, because of the fact that its growth is being pervasive. It's cyclical, but in my view, getting structural, which means it will last longer than expected if we don't make big mistakes, which is always possible given policymakers apologize for the class. Uh, but there are, this window of opportunity offers the possibility of dealing with what I would uh, call three challenges and opportunities for Europe at large. First of all, strengthening growth in a way that takes into account in the medium to long term the fact that demographics uh, work adversely against Europe. In, in a number of ways, meaning that demographics alone cannot support growth, and at the same time, uh, we need to make a Europe much better suited for young people, which means that growth must essentially go to uh, more technology, more innovation, more education, more skills. And this requires an effort which so far, in my view, has been too much only at the national level and too little at the European level. I like to mention, when I speak about these topics, the notion of European Innovation Union, bringing together all the elements, be they economic but also social, educational, technological, that are needed to nurture education, uh, innovation and, and create productivity benefits and jobs. So this is the first challenge. The second challenge, uh, which is very much in the agenda of finance ministers nowadays, is completing monetary union. And especially, this means, especially in the immediate term, competing banking union, which may sound as a very technical issue for many, but it's actually a way to provide additional and final stability to a further integrated economy. Here there are differences among countries' views, which is inevitable when you go from great principles to details. But I am confident that European countries can strike a balance to uh, find a better monetary union working for them and working not just for them, the 19 members of the European uh, uh, Monetary Union, but for the, all the 27 members of the European Union uh, to a number of ways. First of all, because a stable Eurozone provides stability for Europe as a whole. And secondly, because there are a number of issues in which all 27 countries must be involved, starting with banking union itself and capital markets union. The third challenge is about what I call, uh, as in a shortcut, production of European public goods. There are challenges which are now, by definition, immediately European. In other words, there are challenges which cannot be addressed only at the national level because they, if, they, if that's the case, it will, uh, they're bound to fail. And the European public goods that come to mind are almost obvious. One, uh, which is, uh, of course, uh, see the involvement of many countries represented at this table, migration issues, which is a, a broader issue encompassing not just border control, but deeper integration uh, principles of countries that are now sending population in a way towards Europe, and this must be addressed on a European basis. Security, uh, which uh, of course takes up, uh, unfortunately, new forms and new threats which require collaboration at the technological level as well as, uh, as security in, in, in stricto sensu. And defense, I think that progress on building elements of a common defense system are elements that can reinforce uh, union towards more uh, to a deeper integration, including at the political level. And last but not least in my short list uh, is <coughs> uh, investment in innovation, which is related to the point I mentioned earlier. Why am I mentioning these public goods? Because now the time is right, ripe to introduce explicitly these public goods as items of a renovated EU budget. We are, we are now approaching the, the, the time needed to, very fast by the way, the multi-year financial framework and it is time to start introducing not only resources but also concepts that have to deal, to be dealt with at the European level. One final point, 30 seconds, on my country if I may. Uh, Italy is also facing a window of opportunity because of the reasons I mentioned and because uh, it has been uh, producing four years of stability and reform and structural reforms which are delivering very important results in terms of growth, stability and welfare. Uh, 
uh, I hope that my country will be able to continue, but I am convinced it will, to continue to work in a stability environment so that the good work that has been uh, achieved so far is reinforced going forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister Padwan. Minister F von der Leyen, your colleague uh, rightly mentioned that there can be no sustained growth and no stability without security and a robust defense. Uh, I'd like to invite you to add your thoughts to his comments, please. Yes, thank you so much. Um, it was interesting to hear um, that uh, the European youth is calling uh, for Europe to stand up for its values, as you said. And indeed, um, the European population and mainly young people in Europe ask Europe to care for the large and huge challenges and to be active on this field. And of course, if you want to stand up for your values, values of democracy, the rule of law, the protection of human rights and human dignity, you need a strong Europe that is well organized and that is able um, to tackle conflicts and crises, uh, it, mainly in its neighborhood. If you look at Europe, it's surrounded by an arc of crisis, whether you look at fragile uh, states in Africa or at the conflict and civil war and the terror in the Near and uh, Middle East or the hybrid war in the Ukraine. And all over the place was when these conflicts started a strong call for Europe. Europe and European defense and security, um, this is a long story. Europe once started in 1954 with defense and then it failed completely four years later. And from then on it was a sleeping beauty for at least 50 years. Um, now, in this time of crisis, um, Europeans woke up and understood that nobody will solve the problems in our neighborhood for us. We have to organize ourselves, we have to stand up, and we have to be able to create a European Defense Union. This is what we did last year in December. It was already um, encapsulated in the Lisbon Treaty, but never activated. We now activated in this time of action, the call for action, uh, the European Defense Union. 25 of 27 European countries joined. It is ambitious, it is inclusive, and it shows a strong will to be able to have a strong European voice in conflicts in our neighborhood. What is the European voice? The European voice is, of course, on one hand, the ability to um, send troops for stabilization, but always combined and linked with reconciliation uh, diplomat uh, diplomacy and diplomatic efforts and reconstruction and stabilization economic development. These are tools that are unique in the European tool set. And for the very first time, we were able now with the European Defense Union we're building up to um, bring these different strengths together and to apply them in a coherent and consistent way. We created a headquarter. We are on our way to fill the European Defense Union with life, with projects. We are on our way to uh, build up a European Defense Fund. And we have a planning process that obliges all of us to really harmonize our planning in the fields of security and defense. So if the young people are calling for action, um, we are on our way to deliver a bold action what European security and defense is concerned. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Signora Marcegaglia, I've been in Davos uh, for the sixth time now, and every year the story about Europe is a different one. We've gone from crisis to post-crisis to recovery to boom, uh, careful, optimistic. Uh, where do you see Europe at the moment uh, from a private sector perspective? Well, thank you. <coughs> well, first of all, let me say that um, I'm very happy that uh, 
uh, in the documents and also today, we are back and we are talking about European values. I think this is very important because uh, sometimes these values are uh, given from granted, uh, but I think this is also time to uh, underline that these uh, uh, values are important one, and I was very happy also to see in the documents that young people in Europe uh, thinks that these values are very important. So, first of all, I think it's important to say this. Uh, from an economic point of view, <coughs> I think we can say that uh, we are out of recession. We are uh, living in Europe, uh, uh, I would say, a, a good growth. Of course, it's never enough. Uh, but uh <coughs> the, the growth uh, this year was around 2.3%. The projection for next year and for the next two years, let's say, is more or less the same. Um, uh, there has been uh, uh, over 9 million jobs created since uh, 2012. This is something, of course, uh, uh, unemployment is still high, but uh, is, uh, the, the rate of unemployment is going down. Uh, I agree with, Mr. with Minister Paduan saying that, uh, yes, this growth is, is for part is, is cyclical, but we have also some elements that can make the, <coughs> the, the growth more fundamental. So if you think about also uh, how investments are going, uh, export is very strong. Uh, uh, so there are also elements where we can say that uh, our growth is, is fine. So. Uh, the situation is better compared with uh, the, the previous years, as you said. Also, the political situation, I think, in Europe is much better. Uh, we had uh, some uh, elections uh, at national level that were very good. France, uh, the Netherlands, also Germany. Now we hope that this coalition government will be formed. And also in Italy, I, 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 I totally agree with uh, uh, our Prime Minister Gentiloni saying that uh, if you look at Italy, we never had... Uh, difficult situation, our foreign, no, we, we had a lot of difficult situation, but uh, if you look at our foreign, uh, foreign uh, um, uh, uh, policy or whatever, it always been very pro-European. So whatever will be the outcome of the election, I mean, uh, uh, Italy will remain European and I think uh, the reforms will go on. So I think uh, also from a, politi a political point of view, Europe is in a better situation. Uh, as it has been said, I think uh, we don't uh, have to be complacent with this, saying, okay, everything is fine, just sit down. I think we have to see this as a, a window of opportunity. I think reforms must go on, uh, both at national level and the European level. And I think also at the European level, we have a, a, a year where we can really do some step forward. We have uh, one year, more or less, from the next uh, uh, um, election of the European Parliament, and I think there are some points where we really need to make progress. I agree on the points that uh, Minister Paduan said, so education, the uh, Economic Monetary Union, defense, uh, security, immigration. I will add trade. I think in this situation where there is a lot of protectionism coming back, I think it's very important that Europe stand as a very open market and as a, a really uh, continent that believe in open trade and in, over, in open market. I think it's also a time where Europe takes also responsibility, for example, towards Africa. This is very important. Uh, and the second thing, I think uh, we have to be very strong in the industrial policy uh, linked with Industry 4.0. We are a little bit ahead uh, on some things. On some things, we are a little bit, a little bit uh, you know, not in line with, for example, what's going on in the U.S. and China. But I think this is time to really become very strong and took the leadership and take the leadership on Industry 4.0. So I think we have the opportunity to do that. Uh, there is this window of opportunity. I think it's very important that we take the leadership and we really deliver uh, to the European citizen a lot of good results on that. Thank you very much. I think when you mentioned the formation of the German government, I, I think I heard some thunder from above, so it's good <laughs> that, the others, uh, that we're making progress there. Uh, Jörn, uh, let me turn to you. Uh, Martina mentioned when she, when she gave the highlights of that report and uh, the highlights from that conversation, especially with the young Europeans, she men mentioned skills and education and she mentioned sustainability. And I know that these are issues that you feel very strongly about. Maybe you can, you can add your perspective on that, please. Certainly, I'm delighted to. Um, I think when we talk about equipping citizens with required skills, we actually need to go all the way back to childhood. Because the skills that our workforce in the future requires is actually the skills we are born with. Children are natural, cu naturally curious, they're natural learners, they explore, they take risk, they experiment, and they adapt and learn 
extraordinary quickly. That's why when you're four year old, you can be acting as if you were the president of the United States. But 25 years later, you have to go to acting school to be able to do that because you've forgotten how to be playful and creative. So we need to start looking at childhood and how we nurture through early childhood and all the way through our education systems, the ability of European citizens to continue to be learners who are curious and willing to adapt new skills. Because where technology will take us in the future will make it impossible for the education sector to give us an education in our youth that remains relevant for a period of 20 and 30 years. The European workforce of the future needs to be able to constantly adapt, to constantly take in new skills, and that takes almost sort of a neurological order where you're capable of unlearning things and learning new things. And being playful is actually the key to be able to do that. I really welcome one of the specific elements or big ideas in the Renew Europe report that talks about the universal right to learn. I think the idea of giving human-specific skills such as creativity, collaboration, critical thinking uh, to all citizens of Europe and enable young people and adults to acquire the skills that are essential in the future is a wonderful idea. Think about it. What is it technology enables us to do? Te technology is very good at what we are very bad at. Computation, prediction, calculating on big numbers, doing analytics. But machine learning and artificial intelligence is very bad at what's very easy for us. Common sense, caring, love, those kind of qualities, the creative thinking, the lateral thinking, the unexpected insights are the things that human beings will always be better at. So we need to nurture that in the European education of the future. I want to just wrap up by giving a few remarks on sustainability. I think anybody who talks to the young people of Europe know that they have high expectations to our ability to build a sustainable society. And therefore the future of business in Europe has to be based on 100% renewable energy and the consumption and recycling of sustainable materials such that we leave a better future behind for future generations than simply creating a world that's worse off from an environmental and sustainability perspective. And young people of Europe are expecting this. This is not something we can deal with in the future. It's something we need to address now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's uh, open the floor for qu question and answers. We have microphones. Uh, if I could see a show of hands, um, if there are any questions, yes. Right in the center, uh, we have a question. If you could state your name and organization for the sake of the online audience. Sure, Florian Eder from Politico. Uh, ministers, or I'm interested in everybody else's view. We heard a lot of uh, multilateralism today in the speeches of uh, Prime Minister Gentiloni, uh, of President Macron, and of uh, Chancellor Merkel. That seems to be the new consensus where Europe rallies around. Um, so my question would be, to what extent was, uh, was President Trump uh, helpful or um, needed to, for Europe to come back and, and to be back today on center stage. Thank you very much. Uh, should we take a second question? Yes, there's a gentleman over there. Um, microphone is coming. Again, if you could state your name and organization, please. Yes, uh, Thomas Seifert, Wiener Zeitung. Um, the rosy picture you're painting is certainly reassuring for European citizens, but what about uh, the European values that you mentioned? What about Hungary or Poland? or to a certain degree even Romania. What does your report say on that or what is your comment on uh, European values that maybe in some countries are not really that valued? Thank you very much. And there's a third question from the gentleman there. If you could add that, please. Yeah, um, <clears throat> Alessandro Speciale, Bloomberg News. Uh, two questions on the European optimism for Minister Padwan. Um, the first one is, how does the European uh, continent plan to respond from the protectionist noises that are coming from the Trump administration? And uh, the second question is, uh, uh, you have painted an optimist picture of what Italy has achieved in the last few years. Can this continue if there is a, a stalled parliament and if there is no majority uh, as the outcome of the upcoming elections? Thank you. Thank you very much. 
So I might add that there will be tomorrow a press conference with the Prime Minister of Poland as well. And as we know, the President will be speaking on Friday. So um, uh, some of these answers we will probably get uh, in the remainder of the week. Nonetheless, uh, who of the panelists wants to? Uh, Minister Padoan, I think the last question was uh, particularly addressed at you. Maybe you want to uh, start with that. Actually, I understand I have two questions to answer. But, uh, well, the issue of uh, protection uh, strikes me as uh, a threat. Uh, for many years, uh, we have been witnessing uh, a move towards greater multilateralism, global governance, addressing uh, together advanced and emerging economies, for instance, through the G20 global issues. And now the fact that, very significant fact, that today we are discussing about possible protectionist threats and what is Europe willing and able to do to respond uh, sounds to me worrying as a sign of concern and therefore the need to respond. Europe is a global trade uh, partner. Uh, it is, uh, its growth has been based on internal integration and external opening. So it's in the immediate interest of Europe to have open markets and a global governance. If there are other countries that think that this is not their case, well then Europe must uh, put on the table the fact that although there might be individual measures that themselves may not be quote unquote harmful uh, if they strike uh, at other countries. What concerns me is that history shows that if you start with a little move towards more protection, then a possibility is that there is a tit-for-tat sc scenario by which these moves are uh, reiterated and replicated to retaliation. So my plea, and I'll stop here on this question, is that Europe takes the opportunity of finding again, like in defense, like the minister mentioned in defense, find a solution which is not aggressive in terms of trade relation, but it is peaceful and cooperative, of course, while having in mind that there are interests to defend. Very quickly on Italy, uh, the Italian economy is now on a healthier growth and stability course, uh, which uh, has a self-fulfilling moment, in my view, because of past measures that are beginning to show their impacts in terms of structural change, in terms of benefits from lower taxes. Uh, this path may be put in question if there is political uncertainty lasting for too long, which determines a s an interruption of, or say, investment. Uh, I do not think this will be the case. Uh, I am confident that the fundamental strength of the Italian economy, but also Italian society, will uh, give ve very little room to situation to a political situation where uh, there is what I call the Terminator syndrome, meaning eliminating what has been done uh, well in the previous in the previous past rather strengthen what has been done thank you minister uh, who would like uh, to answer Florian Eder's question on did it take the uh, external pressure of president trump's agenda for europe to come together uh, I'd, I'd like to answer that because in the field of defense it was a typical situation um, if we were talking about a europe that protects um, I just mentioned that we had embedded in the Lisbon Treaty always the idea or the vision of uh, the European Defence Union, the so-called uh, permanent structured cooperation, but it was sleeping there and nobody ever triggered it or activated it. And um, what we saw was um, when a crisis hit, that even if the political will was there, the European Union was not able to respond quickly and fast enough because we had neither, neither the structures nor the procedures um, to be fast in a crisis. If you look at Ebola, it came fast. We were supposed to react as Europeans. We were unable because we didn't have the structures and procedures, so everybody went on a national basis. We started a phone call from one nation to the next and we went over um, to, to help with Ebola. Same with Mali. When Mali was about to collapse, Europe was not able to react. It needed the French initiative.
to prevent the worst, just to name two examples. So we had the theoretical frame, but it was, we couldn't bring it to life. Um, we started, therefore, uh, right around the Brexit referendum because uh, our British friends always opposed any kind of common European defense. We, uh, Germany and France, started an initiative. And I will never forget that it was at the height of the refugee crisis in 2016 that we had a very poor response, skepticism of other European countries um, who didn't give a dime on Europe to be able to really maneuver and to uh, step forward. And then came the 8th of November 2016 and the election of uh, the American president who had said NATO is obsolete. And this was a turning point because um, this made clear, this was the wake up call to all Europeans, if you do not care for your own problems, if you are not able to construct a frame that is uh, as sufficient that you can handle your problems. Nobody else will solve the problems for you. And that was the point from which on with a huge um, emphasis and huge momentum, we were able in a record time of a few months to indeed build the European Defense Union, the so-called permanent structured cooperation, all the tools I just mentioned. So in a certain way, uh, the election of the American president <laughs> reminded Europe that it is time <laughs> to step up and to take on responsibility on our own shoulders. It's in our interest. Thank you. Emma, you want to add to that? Yes, yeah, just on, on multilateralism and Trump. Well, I think uh, the, 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 the right design when you talk about trade is to have uh, a multilateral agreement so that WTO is you know uh, the, the the body who has to, to 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 implement that and on the other hand I think it's normal and it's fair that you also have some uh, uh, bilateral good bilateral FTA so now the question is that uh, uh, it seems that US will not uh, uh, stay with uh, the, the rules uh, of uh, WTO uh, I think it's very important to say that some of the rules of, uh, of WTO probably has to be changed because this rule has been designed and shaped uh, some decades ago when uh, digital was not there, where e-commerce was not there, where industry 4.0 was not there. So probably we need some reforms at the at, um, at, uh, WTO level. But the question is that uh, the, the you don't have to answer by saying I don't respect the rules, but the, the question is, uh, or the answer is, you have to stay within and respect form the rules. So this is what I think uh, Europe has to say very clearly to uh, to, um, to to US. Um, I, I, I was in a table with um, uh, uh, the secretary Wilbur Ross. He said something interesting because he said that uh, he want to go on with TTIP. This was the first time I, I hear this. I don't know if um, it's fine, but he said this. Uh, so um, my question, my, my point is that I don't think we have to fight against U.S. I think we have to talk to them very clearly. I think we have to have a very clear and unified position in Europe. And, uh, and uh, saying also very clearly that um, if the aim of, uh, of the U.S. is to punish China, if uh, they disregard themselves from the multilateral uh, uh, rules, what happens is that they will give more force to China because China will be the one who will really play and shape uh, the new standardization, the new standard for the next future. So I think we have to talk to them and have a very clear and strong position on this point. Thank you very much. And there was one last question from, uh, from the Wiener Zeitung, um, whether the discussion about yes. values um, is indeed uh, equally uh, led in, in, in all of Europe. Um, does anybody want to comment on that? Um, Martina, maybe you want to point out that the, that the group that worked on the report was also including these countries. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, no, we, we did have representation from our hubs in, in those countries. And clearly, there are differences of opinion. but. Uh, you know, generally, the next generation really has uh, new demands. I think to the to the leadership of 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 Europe, both the private and public sector. Um, but also, Europe needs to recognize that perhaps not only the values are important, but also what people value in Europe needs to be perhaps more obvious. 
How can Europe provide value to its citizen? Why is it meaningful? Why do they need Europe? And this is maybe also something that needs to be looked at uh, across the board and across the different topics that we've discussed today. And maybe in some areas, like secure and defense, it is much more obvious where there is a collaboration needed across the continent and perhaps in other areas there can be more national solutions to, to some of the, the challenges. Can I say something one thing? Well, I think rule of law is one of the basement of democracy. So when you don't have, you don't respect rule of law, this is a problem. I think um, the European Commission take uh, a strong position on that. No? They, they, uh, they um, send uh, th these countries and Poland and Hungary to, to the court. So um, I think, uh, uh, I mean, it's impossible to have uh, uh, a, a, an integrated Europe without the respect of the, uh, of the rule of law. I don't have any doubt on that. So um, yeah, maybe we can get one, one last question uh, from the gentleman here. I think then we really have to close and, uh, but please. Um, a question on China. So today there is also this speech by uh, one of the, the key uh, economic architects uh, from China. Um, I recently also had uh, an interview with the number three at ECB, ben Benoit Coet, the Frenchman. He added, actually added a political point saying we are not one of those countries that is against trade. With Europe uh, now coming back uh, economically but also politically, we can join hands with China to provide stability for the world. So I'm just wondering, especially for the two ministers, um, given uh, Liu He's speech today, uh, mentioning about uh, implementing a lot of financial opening measures within this year and also uh, expanding import to get a more balanced current account in China. Um, does it give you more confidence to work with China going forward? Um, in the past few months, there has been some challenges, especially on investment. Thank you very much. Um, quite a complex question. Um, do we have any volunteers? Um, I think the, 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 the key question here is um, uh, Europe's uh, collaboration with China. Uh, how confident are you? Well, I, I cannot comment on the uh, um, complex economic um, issues you just mentioned. But um, we're talking here about multilateralism. This was a word that occurred often. And uh, the pictures we painted was, of course, about Europe, but this goes for the whole world. China is an important player, and if we want to solve problems, we need all important players at the table. Of course, the United States. Of course, China. We will deal with Russia, and Europe wants to be a strong voice <coughs> in this concert. We have other important players, I didn't mention now, but um, I think it, it is a, uh, in this session here in Davos, you see the crucial question, um, are we convinced that multilateralism is the way to improve the state of the world? My answer is yes. Or is somebody convinced that nationalism and isolation and protection, protectionism, is the answer. My personal view is a uh, uh, no. Does it mean that multilateralism means always we have the same uh, views on topics? No, it doesn't have to be, but we are on a basis that we want to deal with difficult topics together. And uh, we have issues with China without any question, and we have to debate about these issues. But we always think it is better to have a strong European voice a um, one European voice, um, but that is speaking with other um, huge players in the world. Thank you very much. So there's optimism in Europe, but a lot of work remains to be done, which also means that I now have to release uh, our, my panelists to let them get back to work. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Thank you very much for being here in the room, and thank you for our live stream audience for watching. Thank you. Thank you.